Teaching Blast. Technical seminars are an Intertech production. For instructor-led.net, Java, and XML courses, visit us at www.intertech.com. couple of other things that we have available, monitor and thread. So if I want to take a look at uh, the uh, monitor here, we can see that we get uh, more information on uh, the permanent size. I just want to show you, this is what we were looking at initially, but I want you to just take a look at that. That uh, space is getting used up pretty fast. So you can see that we're exceeding what was initially um, allotted to us in terms of our perm gen space. Now, if I start to see that happening quite a bit, I may want to go in and start to make a modification, um, either in code, where I try to figure out, am I loading too many classes? Or I could say, let's, you know, add a little bit more to the JVM as a command line configuration to increase that heap size. All right, one final thing I want to show you here before we go to some more, like, actual live code stuff, um, and that is going to be uh, the visual garbage collector. If when you first use Visual VM, you're not going to see visual garbage collector available to you. And the way that you get this is by going to tools and selecting plugins. Um, there will be some that are automatically available for you that are um, available. Unless you've downloaded any, you can add your own plugins. But you select the ones that you want and you can install it. Uh, when I went to this particular screen, I found Visual Garbage Collector, selected it, and installed it. But you can uh, download third-party plugins for Visual VM. You can even create your own. If you go to the website, and again, this is outside the scope of this uh, seminar, but you are able to go and create your own plugins uh, for this. So they have a whole API and explanation of how to use that. So once I uh, selected that, I have this a tool that looks like this. Here's my garbage collector. And so you can see, here's all those different areas of the heap that we were talking about. Your permanent generation, your old generation, and then your young, which is broken into the uh, section of Eden, as well as your survivor spaces. Over the side, we can start to see over time what is happening, has, how long is it taking to compile classes, um, what's happening in the Eden space. When you see a lot of spikes like this, this typically means that there are objects that are being created in the release, created in the release, um, and you have to make a decision like, well, that's probably making the garbage collector go kind of a little bit haywire. Do I need to handle that for any reason? Um, you can take a look at your old generation here. If I start to see a very consistent climb in my old generation, meaning more and more objects are being created and they're not released, more and more up, 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 then that, that would tell me is, okay, am I holding on to references for too long? Um, is there something else I could do to start to clean this up? Maybe references that I can set to null. And again, down here is my permanent generation speed, space. Okay, so with that said, let's uh, go back to some code and actually see how this would behave for some uh, different types of scenarios. And actually, before I do that, let me go back. Just wanted to show you a feature matrix here. So if you're going to use uh, Visual VM, um, you can use it with uh, 1.4.2, JDK 5, 6, etc. cetera. Um, but depending on which system you use, which JVM, that will di dictate what features of Visual VM you're, supposed to, you're allowed to use. So if you're using JDK 1.4.2, um, the only things that you're going to be able to use are that overview tab and the monitor. Nothing else will work. Um, if you use JDK 5, you have a few more things. Um, you have the threads that you can use. Uh, an MBeam a browser, that's for JMX, uh, wrapper for JConsole plugins, that works. But again, not everything is fully featured. It's not until you get to use JDK 6 that you get to use all the options that I've shown you. Um, if you use, and that has to be local, so things that you're doing locally. If I'm connecting to a remote server, again, there's certain tabs that aren't going to work. Um, the system properties isn't going to work, the threads, uh, uh, the profiler, the uh, thread dump, the heap dump, those things will not work uh, remotely. All right, so we'll get some code in a second. Let's just talk about some of the different windows we saw, what those mean. Now, I've gone over a little bit of this while I was showing you the features, but let's put it all together and talk about it at once. 
So once a bottleneck is identified, there are often several choices on how you can fix it. So, for example, you find that a method may, uh, takes too long to execute. Um, if a method takes too long to execute, you can choose um, better programming algorithms and data structures. You can decide to have this area of code, code called less frequently. Um, that sometimes doesn't seem as obvious when you're looking at a problem. But for example, you might find that um, maybe the method that you're calling is executing some logic that needs to be executed. I mean, the information is needed. However, the results are always the same. They're constantly getting the same results. So in that case, maybe you can cache those results, and that way you don't have to keep calling that logic over and over again to run that calculation. So sometimes caching works so that you don't have to call that area of code as frequently. If your application's running out of memory, well, this is an, you need to identify opportunities here to cache objects. Um, that's one possible option. You can modify code to ensure there's no loitering objects, and by that I mean a memory leak. So um, let's say you have a collection. Um, a collection often is a culprit that will hang on to an object longer than that is necessary. This is a really um, frequent, like for example, if I have a listener. So you can imagine that I have an object and then I want to listen when things on that object change. So I add maybe it to uh, some sort of collection that has, here's an object and here's its listener. Here's another object and here's its listener. Meanwhile, the object that that's being listened to uh, becomes nulled for some reason later. It's no longer valid for the application. Yet, that collection I just created that was linking objects to listeners, objects to listeners, that's still around. So it keeps a hold of these references and thus your objects can't be um, garbage collected. So when you run into situations like that, you want to consider using weak references. So weak references, um, caches, you got to be a little bit careful with. Um, but uh, typically, like if you have some sort of a listener, um, weak references will work really well. And what are weak references? It says, look, I've got an object that, you know, maybe I'm using as a key in some sort of a weak hash map. Now, if that object is garbage collected and the only thing that's pointing to that object is this collection itself, well, then, in that case, it's uh, not as needed anymore. In fact, let me show you a code example of that. It'll be a little easier to understand. Back to my desktop. Let's see. Here's an example of a weak reference. I'm just here, I'm using a weak hash map. So you can imagine I have two classes. I have a uh, sender, something that's just going to send some information, and I have a listener that wants to listen for information. I create these two objects, and uh, let's say the sender is doing a whole bunch of stuff. It just happens to have a listener that's going to be paying attention to it over time. So what I could do is just create a hash map and link these up two up together, but later in the code, or somewhere else in the code, maybe that sender becomes nulled. Maybe that sender is no longer needed in the application. Well, the actual object in the heap is not going to be garbage collected because I have a hash map that is containing uh, that sender um, as the key. So it's a strong reference. It will not be garbage collected because we still have a single reference pointing to it. By using a weak hash map, what you're saying is, look, I know I'm using that test sender as my key, but if for some reason um, that uh, sender becomes nulled out elsewhere and the only reference left is that test sender in the weak hash map, you can garbage collect it. So weak hash map is really good for helping you um, in scenarios where you might be hanging on to a reference for much too long. So consider using weak references. Uh, and by the way, if you want more information on weak uh, references and some of the pros and cons of those, I did include a um, link in my resources for you to check out. Again, applications running out of memory. Maybe you want to configure the heap differently. There are JVM command line options um, that uh, will allow you to change. These are your ergonomics that I mentioned before that will change how the heap behaves. Again, I'm not going to list all the different command options here, but in one of the uh, resources that I listed, they go through and talk about some of the more common options that you can use. Finally, you know, you may just want to add more hardware. 
you might just need to add more memory. There are theoretical and practical limitations of how much memory and hardware that you can add, depending on whether you're on a 32-bit system or a 64-bit system. So that solution sometimes only works up to a certain point. For more free learning resources and to see the latest lineup of our instructor-led.net, Java, and XML courses, visit us at www.intertech.com.